So in the Sunday school lesson, you see the name of the lesson, the marks of a God-honoring church. So we're going to be looking in the book of Acts. So if you want to turn there to the book of Acts, book of Acts uh, chapter 1 and 2, that's where we'll be starting. So Acts chapter 1 and 2, we'll look at it there and get going with the lesson. You know, if you want to go somewhere in your car, you need to get gas in the tank. You can't just, well, now you have the electric car, so maybe you need to plug it in um, for a little while. But if there's not gasoline in the tank or if it's not charged, uh, you're not going anywhere. Uh, gasoline is an indispensable element. So gasoline stations are places that are set up uh, to get what you need. Uh, in order to get filled up, though, you have to go there. You have to go to that gas station. Many Christians don't get filled up because they don't get to where they can get filled up, and that's church. It's a, a gas station. It's a grocery store. It's a necessity store where we can get life essentials uh, for spiritual growth. We all right? Uh, today we're going to look, and this morning in Sunday school, we're going to look at what makes uh, a God-honoring church. Hopefully we'll learn some important tools and some things that will help us. Uh, an author wrote many years ago, imagine gang members, drug dealers, racists, um, uh, crime, people involved in crime being transformed by the gospel. Imagine politicians and judges other influential leaders taking stands based on the Word of God. Imagine hundreds and even thousands of people being saved in one single church service. Well, imagine the unimaginable. It happened. This all happened in the pages of Acts, and it can happen again uh, if we pay the price, though. The early church, as recorded in the book of Acts, was a dynamic, growing church that turned the world upside down, as the Bible says. Despite incredible opposition, terrible persecution, first from the Jewish authorities and then from the might of the Roman Empire itself, the church began and grew dynamically so that within 300 years, the Roman Empire, which I don't necessarily agree with Constantine and his decree, uh, but Constantine basically uh, decided to just cave and surrender to everybody needs to be a, Christ, a Christian, and if, you, if not, we'll kill you, <laughs> uh, which is not really Christian. Um, but he finally gave into it. It was so powerful a movement that they wanted, he basically surrendered to it and said the whole world has to be, be Christians. So think about that as far as how was that possible? Why did that happen? Uh, was there, what was there about the early church that gave it strength and enthusiasm and unity to face incredible odds and outlast strong opposition? So I think that much of the uh, secret of the early church and uh, the marks of a god honoring church we can find in the pages of the book of Acts. And so uh, this morning from the book of Acts, we're going to look at a few characteristics of a God-honoring church. We put a, a poem in the back of your handout called The Army of God. Uh, I love that poem. It says, The army of God is arising this hour, rising in God's holy might to do battle in his power. For this is the season we need to begin to rise to show the world uh, God's holy truth and the hope of our risen Christ. We need to fight our enemy every step that we take because he is there uh, to pull us down and sow doubt within our faith. For if we listen to his lies and fall beneath his attack, the power of God we had before we find we soon will lack. It's not worth the agony to give in to his ways, but keep your faith in Jesus Christ strong as your spirit prays. For this is what empowers us and builds us more, much more, so we can arise more boldly against the enemy of the Lord. We need to become an army of God. How can we become a Christ-honoring or a God-honoring church? We're going to look at that this morning in our Sunday School Hour. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless. Give us wisdom, guidance as we go and look at some principles from the book of Acts. I pray that your spirit would be evident, 
that you would lead and guide. Do that which I cannot do, and that is speak to hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So in Acts chapter 2, we'll start there, Acts chapter 2. And we'll start in verse 41 and go down to verse 47. Acts chapter 2, 41 through 47. Acts 2, 41 through 47. So why don't we read it responsively, uh, if you don't know what that is. So I'll start and read uh, the first one. You read the second. We'll go back and forth, but just follow my lead. So I'll start 41. We'll read together 42. I do 43. You, uh, together 44, and we'll go down through 47. Beginning in verse 41, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Together. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together, and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So what do we see as far as... Um, having a, a God-honoring church. So I have five points. So point number one, the blank there, they have a God-honoring purpose. They have a God-honoring purpose. There's a story I read uh, many years ago is by a guy named uh, Charles Kahn. Charles Kahn tells of the time when he lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and he noticed in the Yellow Pages a listing of restaurants and there was an entry in the list of retro, uh, restaurants called the Church of God Grill. And it caught his attention. So he called and dialed the number and a man answered and said, Hello, Church of God Grill. And he asked how the restaurant had been given such a unique name. And so the man on the other end said this. He said, Well, we had a little mission down here. And we started selling chicken dinners after church. Uh, and we did that on Sunday afternoons to help pay the bills. And well, people liked the chicken and we did such a good business that eventually we cut back on the church services. And then after a while, we just closed down the church altogether and kept on serving the chicken dinners. Now you think about that. So what did that church lose? Their purpose. The purpose was not to sell chicken dinners. Uh, the purpose was to be a church. It was to follow the purpose that God had given. Well, what is sad is that maybe nobody in that church noticed that they were wandering away from their mission. Instead of being a God-honoring church, they chose to be a great restaurant. And maybe they had great chicken. All right, I like good chicken, all right? But that's not the purpose of a church. And so what does God reveal to us as far as the purpose of a church? So I list three things that is listed in Acts 1 and 2. Um, Acts 1 and 2, and then there's a couple other passages that show it. But first of all, in Acts 1, notice uh, that it says in verse 15, I'm looking here. I'm gonna go to... All right, so uh, let's back up a little bit. So in, in verses uh, 1, 2, and 3, it's the introduction to the book. And then in verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But notice what Christ says in verse 4. But wait for the promise of the Father, which saith ye, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So Christ is telling them right after, remember he gave them the Great Commission. That's found in Matthew chapter 28, Mark 16. We also see it in Luke chapter 24. You see, uh, you see this Great Commission that you're supposed to go into all the world, but after he told him that, he said, wait in Jerusalem. So my first point, as far as your purpose, 
is to obey God. That's number one. As a church, we want to obey God. We want to do what God is saying, first and foremost. Well, here, they were supposed to wait. Their purpose was to obey the Savior. Jesus had asked them to tarry there. Uh, Luke chapter 24 and verse 49, it says, But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Obedience is always a vital link to power and blessing from God. Someone said this, ours is not to reason why, ours is but to do or die. We are supposed to obey God. If we want to have understand God's purpose, then I need to sit at Christ's feet. I need to understand the word of God, and God then can bless us as a church. As a church, we need to sit and say, all right, what does God want us to do? So we should obey God. Then notice, secondly, in the text, look at verse 8. But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be, what? Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Uh, way back in October, in October at Capitol down there in Dover, uh, they have the last week of October is their missions uh, conference. And so at the end of the missions conference, you know, you, we have a Sunday where we're taking pledges and trying to ask God, you're praying through, taking some time to pray, asking God what we should give. Well, the next week, there was a number of missionaries that came in. And then Pastor Moore, the next Wednesday, talked to the church some, and he said, so there's a couple ways that he prays through and presents to the church who they should take on as missionaries. And one of the passages he turned to was Acts 1.8. And notice what it says. As a church, we're supposed to be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and the other most parts of the earth. So uh, he presented to him and he said, so as I taught the church and tried to present it, as a church, we need to obey God. And then secondly, we need to reach out to others, all right? We need to reach out to others. So the Bible instructs us of how we reach out. So we reach out to our Jerusalem. So if we are gonna be a, a, a God-honoring church, we have to have a God-honoring purpose. So we obey God and then we follow him and how to reach out. So what are we supposed to do? Reach Jerusalem. So uh, we came in and we were asking somebody about all these numbers up here. So what are you trying to do with this? Reach your Jerusalem. All right, and then uh, I think I saw a bunch of John Romans, all right, and I don't know if you're distributing John Romans or just trying to uh, hit, um, hit different areas, but you know what you try to do? You reach Wilmington. What's Wilmington to you? Jerusalem. So you reach it. So you can't just say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna um, support all these missionaries to the uttermost parts of the world but forget Wilmington. Guess what? You're not obeying God then. You're not reaching your Jerusalem, so you reach Jerusalem. So Pastor Moore, in talking to the church, was saying, so, you know, I pray about how we're going to reach Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria. You know what that is? That's kind of stretching out a little bit in your area. So Capital Baptist um, helped in planting this church. You know why? It's a Samaria work. It's reaching out. So as a church, we try to help. Uh, we try to help our Jerusalem. We try to help in Samaria, Judea, and Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. That's the missionaries. And I look back there, and uh, I, I actually uh, know uh, I pastored uh, for ten years, and uh, Sam Kim was under me. All right, so I know Sam Kim. Uh, I communicate with him often. And uh, we're, we're good friends. And I just got an email this week that he's in China. All right? That's a part of the work. You, you have a part of reaching the uttermost part of the earth by supporting a missionary to China. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to reach others. So my question is, so are you helping in Jerusalem, though? So one way you help other areas is maybe giving funds towards an account. But how do you reach Jerusalem? 
You do it. You're going to say, oh, it's their job. No, you're part of the church. All right, then hand a track out. Go, uh, go talk to somebody and invite them to church. You're, you're, you're reaching your Jerusalem, so reaching out to others. Notice number three, uh, and this goes to Acts chapter 2. So go to Acts chapter 2, and we read the passage 41 through 47. But did you notice in verse 46, well, 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. So you have that, and then notice in verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And then verse 47 explains a little more. So we have a God-honoring purpose. purpose. Number one was to obey God. Two, to reach out to others. Then three, to build people. So what do we mean by building people? It's daily from house to house, fellowshipping. So it doesn't mean that, what am I trying to do? I'm just, I'm going to house. And so we all would love this if, if the instruction of scripture is like, you know what, what you're supposed to do is go to everybody's house and eat. Like, no, but that's not, you look at the context, what were they doing? They were continuing in the apostles' doctrine. So here's a big word, doctrine. So what does doctrine mean? It means teaching. It simply means teaching. So what were they doing? They were going, and the apostles' doctrine today for us, what would the apostles' doctrine be? It would be this. Or it'd be this, it'd be the word of God. So they're going from house to house, from those that have been saved, and they're helping them understand the scriptures. It's studying. Does the Bible instruct us to do that? Well, yeah, a decent amount. Study to show thyself approved unto God. So we find in scriptures that if I'm going to be a Christ-honoring, a God-honoring church, if I'm going to be a part of a church that honors God, then I need to obey God. Then I need to look in scripture and find out what that means. So it means to reach others and it means to build people. So uh, one of the things that we should be involved in is getting people to know the Lord, but then after they know the Lord, what do we have to do? Help them to grow, take steps of growth. And that comes through reading God's word, studying God's word, uh, helping guide people through God's word so that we become stronger. You know, there's a lot of opinions about God out there. There's a lot of nutty ideas that are out there. As far as uh, you know, God, this past week we brought in a professor uh, <laughs> uh, from Florida, and we were, we were talking about, we were studying uh, Reformed theology uh, for about 12 hours, 11, 12 hours, but he brought all, all kinds of different philosophy. Uh, and some of them, I, I, had never, I had never heard of Manichaeism. All right, so I'm sitting there. I mean, I, I'm sitting there in class, and I'm like, what in the world is that? And so I'm looking it up, and I'm trying to study it. And then there's all kinds of others. There was, I mean, he listed out like five different things that basically flow through Reformed theology. I mean, he was talking about Gnosticism and Neoplatonism uh, and all this. And I'm like... This is crazy, right? But you know what? There is a whole bunch of philosophy and religion that is out there. And when somebody gets saved, that background is still there. And you need to help them flow through Scripture so that gets kind of cleansed out. And they come to Scripture and the Holy Spirit can guide them. And you can be a help in that work. So, number one. Marks of a God-honoring church. One, they have a God-honoring purpose. Notice, number two then, they face great persecutions. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. Now this one, I don't think that you would pray for necessarily, but if you look through the book of Acts, what you will find is they were a God-honoring church. So they looked at, they had a God-honoring purpose, but they faced great persecution. 
Now, I'm not thinking that I want to ask God for this. But what you have to understand, if you are a church that is moving ahead for God, you're going to stir up some enemies, and one of them is going to be the devil. And the devil's not going to be happy when a church is moving ahead against Satan's forces. But look at Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Notice, then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. You know what that means? Simply, hate and wrath and anger. And laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. So what does the Bible say? The Bible is telling us that here they were out speaking for the Lord, and they made some people really mad, so mad that they threw them in prison. See, they faced great persecution. An interesting uh, story from World War II is a story called the Bombs of Adversity, they call it. The Bombs of Adversity, um, the story says when the spring came to England after the bombing raids of 1941 by Nazi Germany, a strange thing occurred. There was a beautiful botanical resurrection, they called it. The explosion brought to the surface seeds of plants which were thought to be extinct. They said 95 different flowers and shrubs were found suddenly growing and blooming in the bomb-pocked landscape of England. You know, sometimes in our life, adversity or persecution brings things. If we, if we surrender to God and we ask God to use this adversity or persecution, if it's used for His glory, guess what will happen? It can bring Precious fruit. And if I'm going to be a God-honoring church, if I'm going to be a part of a God-honoring church, and so specifically this morning, because it's the sixth anniversary, um, it, the church is up, it's going. So how can we please God? Well, we have to have a right purpose. But then we, we got to understand that as you flow through following God, you're going to have you're going to have adversity. You're going to have, you're going to have, uh, you're going to have the devil fight against you. I mean, I know uh, it's one of my prayers for you as a church, if not daily. Uh, 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 Pastor Knickerbocker is on my daily list of prayers. And uh, when, you know, a lot, sometimes I, I'm just praying for his family. Sometimes I'm just, I'm praying also as a church that God leads to a right building, that God uh, leads you to a property. But, I mean, I don't live in Wilmington. You live in Wilmington. Uh, how, how available is property? I mean, is there just land and buildings just sitting around, just like, just drop in your lap? But you know what? God is an amazing God. He is an amazing God. And also, um, if you're doing the work of God and saving souls, the devil's not, the devil's going to fight against you. It's going to seem sometimes impossible. So we have to understand if I'm going to be, if I'm going to be a God honor, a part of a God honoring church, that sometimes I'm going to have to face persecution. You'll notice that in the persecution here, notice I, I list two, it arises from other religions. Did you notice in the text here in verse 17? Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees. These were religious people. You know, sometimes you're doing the work of God, and other religions get mad at you. You're like, oh, what? I mean, you know, I thought all roads lead to heaven. I guess not. <laughs> all right? I mean, you're the ones that say that, but you guys are really mad at me. But part of it is because the truth reveals error. Truth does reveal error. So sometimes persecution arises from religion. It, it arises from people that you sometimes think that you're trying to go the same way. So you have a rise from 
re, uh, other religions. But then the second thing, it arises because of our message. In Acts chapter 7 and 8, Acts chapter 7 and 8 is the story of Stephen, or 6 and 7 is the story of Stephen. Remember the, the deacon, Stephen. So here's Stephen, and what does he do? He gets up and he preaches one of the greatest messages on salvation in Acts chapter 7. And what happens at the end? They fall on their knees and just say, what must I do to be saved? No. They pick up stones, and it says, now, I, I still, uh, this phrase is just funny to me. They gnash on him with their teeth. That's just a funny phrase to me. I just seem like, I'm like, you know, that's a little weird. Um, I, don't, I don't know why you're, you know, chewing on my uh, ankle there. All right, get your teeth off of me. Okay, but here they gnash on him with their teeth, and then they pick up stones, and they kill him. So this goes to the facing great persecution, um, the, the message. So here's Stephen. Now think about this with Stephen. If I was Stephen, and all of a sudden I'm getting stoned upon, I know this is the, my last breath, I might, it might cross through my mind that I don't know how this is bringing God glory. But the next chapter reveals who was standing there. Who was standing there? Saul, which then becomes the Apostle Paul. And most people today, all right, I consider this, Paul is probably the greatest theologian that has ever walked on the face of the earth. And that happened because of persecution. It happened because of persecution. But the persecution arose because of Stephen's message. I've said this often, when you're, when you're preaching or you're presenting the gospel, which that's preaching technically in the scriptures, some, some of the phrases to uh, preach the gospel to every creature, it's not saying all of you become preachers in a pulpit, it's saying you're presenting the gospel. So as a person that is presenting the gospel, what we have to understand, our message sometimes is hard. So what are you telling people? Everything they believed in, if they believed in another religion, everything they believed in is false. And that if they keep going that way, that they are condemned already. If you don't make a decision and you keep going this way, you are condemned already. You don't even have to do anything. You're condemned already. You're doomed to hell. It's not really popular. To say, we were talking about this uh, in class this past week. We were talking about, um, you know, the, the Catholics have a, a weird twist to this, and even the Methodists with original sin. So that's why they want to baptize babies. Because you're, you're baptizing them and you're taking off that original sin, which is really odd. All right? But, um, but we do believe, biblically, in an original sin. We are descendants from Adam. So sometimes people get really upset because you have a little baby there and it was like, oh, it's so cute. And, all that. and, and you get up and you say, hey, that baby's a sinner. <gasps> How can you say it? Well, that baby has, all right, as it grows and matures, and I believe in an age of accountability, but that baby will come to a point where they have to come to an understanding that they are a sinner and mom and dad, even though they come to church, cannot get them saved. It is an individual decision. So every one of us are born in sin. Now, that's hard. Like, wait, there's not an innate goodness in man? No. All of us are cruds. All right? Yep. You're a crud. All right? You're a sinner, heathen. Like, but that's, that's all. So the message that we're bringing to people sometimes can bring opposition, persecution. So the uh, first point, they have a God-honoring purpose. Secondly, they face great persecution. Then, thirdly, go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, and we'll look at verse 20 through 26. Acts chapter 16. 
So as you flow through the book of Acts, you'll see numerous times that they're facing persecution. But in Acts chapter 16, we see another one. It's Paul and Silas uh, in verse 19. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. But look at verse 25. So here they are. You're not just thrown into prison, but you're beaten. And you'd think, all right, so this is not a good day. You know, I don't know what we did out there. Paul and Silas, maybe they're reviewing stuff. They're like, hey, what did you say? They're like, what did you say, man? I mean, why? You don't talk that way. Did you call them names or something? All right, what did you do? All right, so they're reviewing. No, but look at what happens in verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. So what's the third thing? If I'm going to be a God-honoring church, part of a God-honoring church, we have a God-honoring purpose, we face great persecution, persecution, and then third, we are given, or they are given, great peace. You know what happens? Even though you're facing opposition, and as a church, you're trying to move forward for God, during troubling times, you can have peace. You can know that God is with you. You can know that you're a part of a church that is trying to please God, and you get on your knees, and you pray, and you say, all right, God, I know this, is, this just doesn't seem like the path I wanted. It doesn't seem like I didn't really want to. I'm not trying to offend people. I'm not trying to offend these people, but I want to show them Christ. I want, to, I want to reveal to them that there is a way to heaven, but if they keep going down this path, they're on their way to hell. And people don't like it. They get mad. But you can have great peace. You know, we serve a Savior who is called the Prince of Peace. Remember, uh, when Christ was, was introduced to this world at Christmas time, the world has taken it and kind of <laughs> twisted it. You know, they think peace on earth, and they all are holding hands and lighting candles and singing kumbaya. All right, they're not getting it. All right, Christ, Christ as coming and bringing peace on earth, the peace on earth, uh, one is we can have peace on earth because we're not, if we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're not at enmity or we're not at odds anymore with Christ. We are reconciled. So that's one way. And then way down the road, when Christ comes back and he sets up that millennial reign, oh, there's going to be peace on earth. He's going to establish that. So some is a misunderstanding. It's not saying that everybody's going to lay down their arms here on, on the earth and sing kumbaya and we're going to drink eggnog together and swap presents. All right, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about a spiritual peace. It's talking about a peace that I can have even here on this earth when I face opposition so we can have great peace. But then notice number four. So um, we, we saw this in Acts chapter 1. So we'll look at a couple passages that show this. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts chapter 4 and verse 31 through 33 it says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Okay, so we see it there. So what do we, what do we see as far as the fourth thing? 
So marks of a God-honoring church. They have a God-honoring purpose. They face great persecution. They're given great peace. And then number four, they desire God's power. Now, God's power placed upon us or put upon a church is there to help us accomplish what he desires for us as a church. And what is that? To obey God, to reach others, to build people. That's what he wants us to do. So how can we do that? Well, in the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of the Spirit of God. And so we need to be praying and saying, God, help me. And, and biblically, I'll just list them out for you. I list out a couple of things there. So what is required for me to have God's power in my life? I give you three things. It requires a clean life. It requires a consistent walk and a continual asking. And the, the reason I say this, I, I love studying doctrine. One of the doctrines is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us that daily I'm asking God. Uh, you see this in Ephesians, you see it in Galatians, you see it in Colossians. And there it tells me to put off the old man and to put on the new man. And if you read it in the language, it's a daily thing. That's why Paul even said, I die daily. Why was he saying that? Because I, I daily need to come to God because my flesh is pretty strong. Daily, I need to come to him and I need to be asking him. I need to ask God. I need to confess those sins that God brings to mind. The Holy Spirit will convict me and say, hey, you were wrong here and you were wrong here and get those right. So I need a clean life. I need a consistent walk. I need to daily be working towards um, being better and conforming to the image of Christ. And then I need a continual asking. Then number five, and that's found in that passage in Acts 4.31, and when they had prayed. So the last one is they are fervent in prayer. Fervent in prayer. So I ask you, you'd say, well, man, this is the sixth anniversary of our church. Man, it's exciting. So you want to be a God-honoring church. So how do you become a God in your church? Find his purpose. Find his purpose. Second, be willing to face great persecution. And if it comes, it's all right. As long as it's, as long as, it, you know, Peter tells you that. If, you, if you're suffering because you're a murderer or a thief or a robber, yeah, you got issues. Get that right. But if you're doing God's bidding and persecution arise, you know, that happened to our Savior. We can follow in his steps. Then number three, we're given great peace. Do you have great peace? Number four, you desire God's power. And then number five, are you fervent in prayer? You know, prayer takes time. Prayer takes time. It's not just um, a five-minute ditty. And I think even as Christians, that it's one of the things that really puts us to shame. There are religions that have way more dedicated people to something that's false. <laughs> yep, way, way more, way more dedicated. We need to make sure that we are fervent in prayer. We're taking the time making lists and praying through things, organizing it. I think that some people put more effort and energy into organizing their spice rack than they do in their prayer life. And they wonder why they never see an answer to prayer. You know, as a church, that's one of my challenges to you. Tonight, I'm gonna try to uh, show you that in scripture show you many years ago, I was a little frustrated and down, and I did a, a Bible study on just the word able. You know God is able, but some of it is binding together and praying. God desires for you to be a God-honoring 